Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Barry, and I'm the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Graniteville, Vermont. I want to thank you for joining with us today to participate in this online service. I'd uh, like to open our service this morning with a beautiful piano worship song played by pianist Loida Tulu. Hi, my name is Loida, and I'd like to share with you this song in the garden that I think is familiar to all of you.
Hi, welcome back. My message title today is, guess what, still. In his book, I Shall Not Want, Robert Ketchum tells about a Sunday school te teacher who asked her group if any of them could quote the 23rd Psalm. A little four-year-old girl was among those who raised their hands, and but a bit skeptical, the teacher asked that little four-year-old girl if she could really quote the entire Psalm. The little girl nodded, and the teacher motioned for her to come up to the front. The little girl walked up to the podium, turned around to face the class, and made a little bow, and said, The Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want. She bowed again and sat down. Although she obviously missed a few verses, that little girl captured the heart of Psalm 23. First verse in Psalm 23 is, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I'm just going to take us on a journey as we walk through those the six verses that are in this psalm. They're very, very powerful. One of the most famous books that have been written about Psalm 23 was written by a sheep rancher named Philip Keller. In his book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. He says that sheep require more attention than any other livestock. They can't take care of themselves. Unless the shepherd makes them move on, sheep will actually ruin a pasture, eating every single blade of grass until finally a fertile pasture is nothing but barren soil. Sheep are also nearsighted and very stubborn. Maybe you can relate to them. I think I can but they're also very easily frightened. An entire flock can be stampeded by a jackrabbit. They have little means of defense. They're timid, feeble creatures. And their only recourse is to run if no shepherd is there to protect them. Sheep also have no homing instincts. A dog, a horse, a cat, or a bird can find its way home. But when a sheep gets lost, it's a goner, unless someone rescues it. So the overriding principle of Psalm 23 is that sheep can't make it without a shepherd. Isn't it interesting that the scriptures refer to us as sheep? And that is a, a, a very appropriate reference, I think, in comparison. So often we think we know the way, but we don't. We don't know where to go or what to do, and and we desperately need a shepherd. We are so easily spooked and, and, uh, and uh, made afraid and can go down the wrong paths and the wrong direction. And we need someone to guide us and uh, to direct us. And we need a shepherd. And I'm very thankful today that Jesus Christ can and has been my shepherd. And he can be your shepherd also today if you call on him. He'll never leave you or never forsake you. He'll always be there for you like the good shepherd does. You know, verse 2 of Psalm 23 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Well, I'll tell you, that's kind of the way I feel, and many of us feel, in this coronavirus uh, challenge that we've been facing, this pandemic and uh, the need to socially isolate. And um, I've been very busy since I've been home. I drive a school bus usually during the school year. They cancel school early, and I have a lot to keep me busy. I pastor the church, and I'm doing these videos, and I certainly have not felt like I've been just sitting around resting. But I've enjoyed the things that I'm doing. But it's interesting that in verse 2 it says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Most of us don't want anybody to make us do anything, even if it's in our own best interest. And it's interesting that it says that, he makes me lie down. Actually, the Hebrew word for makes here means to cause to rest. Now, that doesn't mean he's forcing us down onto a couch to rest or into a chair. And, and uh, it's this uh, challenge going on between us and God, but sometimes it can be. But it says that he makes us to lie down. He causes us to lie down because it's in our best interests. This reveals the way that God wants to settle us down, 
that the Lord makes it possible for us to rest. Sometimes that's not so easy for most of us. The shepherd, in order to get his sheep to lie down, the shepherd must meet four basic needs. If those needs are met, the sheep will not lie down if there's any hint of any of these issues that they're facing. Sheep will not lie down if there is any hint of fear in them. They're afraid they won't lie down. They, they are not comfortable. They're anxious. Sheep will also not lie down unless they are free from any friction from other sheep. My goodness, if that was the case, most of us would never lie down. Sheep will not lie down if they're bugged by flies or parasites. And sheep will not lie down if they're hungry. So in order for the shepherd to get sheep to lie down, they must be free from fear, free from tension, aggravation, and hunger. The Lord is the only one who can do all of these things for us. He leads us and guides us and assures us of his presence. The shepherd makes or causes the sheep to lie down in cool, soft green pastures. Isn't that wonderful? We would just go, 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 sometimes burning our candle at both ends until there's nothing left. So sometimes God encourages us to rest. And even Jesus himself rested. When he was tired, he would go up to a mountain top and on the side of a mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee, he had his disciples get into a boat and he rested and slept and prayed and talked to God. And, and we also need to do the same thing in our life, to be refreshed and renewed. And oftentimes we give and give and give and have a hard time resting and, uh, and refreshing ourselves. But I want you to know that the scriptures support that. God wants you to rest and to replenish yourself and take care of yourself. And uh, he will help you to rest when you need to, if you and I listen to his voice. Psalm 23 says, he leads me beside still waters. You know, that's a fascinating comparison because when we consider sheep, and of course we're considered sheep, the metaphor for us is sheep. And it says the sheep will only drink from still waters. Sheep are very easily uh, intimidated and uh, afraid. And uh, they, if they go near a, a brook that has running water, they're afraid they'll fall in and die. And so th they are afraid of the swift moving water. And so they will not drink from that water for the fear that they will perish. Uh, the shepherd, therefore, is always on the watch for still waters when he's tending his sheep, wherever he's going in the pastures, because shepherds would lead sheep from one pasture to another uh, pasture so that the sheep didn't eat all the, all the grass and the uh, edibles that were on that uh, pasture. And so the shepherd in his journeys with the sheep would always be looking not for rushing mountain streams, but for quiet, still waters where the sheep could go and have their uh, thirst quenched in a peaceful setting. You and I need to have our uh, thirst quenched in quiet, peaceful places. And God will lead us into those places where we can rest in him. God wants us to be at peace and not anxious and worried all the time because when we're anxious and worried, you know, we can't hear God. We can't hear his voice because we're so full of anxiety and fear and, and that, uh, you know, we don't hear anything but ourselves. All we listen to sometimes is the fear and the anxiety or the busyness of life. And yet Psalm 46 verse 10 echoes the fact that we should be, uh, be still and beside still waters. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. What does that mean? Be still and know that I'm God. Sometimes think, okay, well, God, where are you? I'm still, but I'm not sure if you're on the job today. God is always on the job. He never gives up. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Even though we may not have the answers that we would like sometimes, God will never leave us or desert us. And when we learn about him and grow in our relationship with him, we can learn to settle into his love and to be still in our, in our actions and especially in our hearts because we can come to know that he is God 
and that he loves us and cares for us, that he sent Jesus into this world to die for our sins so that you and I could be saved and find rest and peace from our the condemnation of our sins and the consequences of our sins. We can't undo our past, and God knows that. And so he sent Jesus as a Savior into this world to be our shepherd, to die on the cross for us so that we could call on his name and ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness and have peace in our hearts with our lives and peace in our hearts with God, the only uh, one that can judge us. And he has found us not guilty through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, one of my favorite uh, passages of scripture for a long time has been uh, Psalm 16. And in Psalm 16, it says, uh, uh, two, verses 5 and 6 are great verses. It says, Lord, you have assigned to me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. And in verse 6, it says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Now that's very similar to uh, the passage of Scripture in Psalm 23, or Psalm 46, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. Lord, you've assigned me my portion in my cup. You have made my lot secure. Isn't that amazing when we confess that, Lord, you've assigned me my portion. I may not have everything I'd like, everything I want, but what I have, I have received from you. And if I confess that, that I know that you have given me my portion in life, you've given me a certain number of skills and talents, you've given me uh, uh, my job, you've given me my family, you've given me where I live, you have led me to these places. And so what I have comes from your hand and you have assigned it to me. And the result in that is when I rest in that, when I'm not uh, always wanting something else or wanting to uh, expand all the things that I have. Instead, I can rest in what you've given to me and, and I can celebrate that. It says that you have made my lot secure. That if you've surrendered your life over to God, one of the places that you can find peace is to realize right now I am right where God wants me. Uh, in my marriage and in my family and in my situation, certainly, unless you're in an abusive uh, situation, and then God will help you, guide you to get help and direction and counsel uh, to address those issues. But for the most part, we can rest in where we're at, and we can be uh, celebratory over our lives and the things that God has given to us instead of always wanting more and instead of uh, cursing what we have and being jealous of others who have uh, bigger portions or larger cups than us or, or that we feel like, gee, I should have what they have. And why don't I have that? Instead of celebrating what God has given to us and being thankful for that. Verse 6 is, The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I remember, be, I've been in ministry a long time, over, over 20 years, almost 30 years in different situations in ministry. And uh, there have been times, especially in church planning, where uh, I just didn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. And I would go to the Lord and say, have I missed you, God? Am I in the wrong place? Have I miscalculated? Did I, I miss your direction in my life? And do you really want me to be in this situation or in another situation? And, uh, and often the Holy Spirit would speak to me. I remember the first time it happened. I was in prayer at our church, and I was praying and saying, gosh, this is really hard. I don't know if I can do this. And maybe I missed you. Maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I should be something out, doing something else. And the Holy Spirit just uh, quickened to my heart Psalm 16. And so I opened it up. I didn't know what was in there. I don't have that kind of memory. I wish I did. Many people do. Uh, and I opened up Psalm 16. As I read down through Psalm 16, I got to verse 6, and it just jumped out at me. And it said, The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. It was like God gave me a rhema word or a God-breathed word for me. One is Logos, which is the general revelation of uh, Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It's just the general accumulation of all of that knowledge that's there. And so there's Logos, and that's used sometimes to describe the full word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And then there's a Greek word called rhema, which is R-H-E. 
and a rhema and rhema is a god breathed personal word that god gives to you or to me when we seek him and if you've ever been reading scriptures or been listening to a message or listening to a worship song or anything on on uh, any anywhere and sometimes you'll hear something a word and and it will just quicken to your heart and give you life and it will give you direction and encouragement and confidence and you'll have a sense of that word uh that teaching that a truth is just for you and God is giving it to you to encourage you and to help you to move forward with your life. Well, that's what I got that day when I opened that up and uh, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. And when I got that, I thought, okay, I can rest in this. I'm going to receive this word and make it mine and I can celebrate where I am in my life because all of us could be somewhere different. We could all be doing something different. And uh, but when we realize and believe that the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, then I can celebrate my life. I can celebrate what I have, my portion, my cup. I can celebrate the people I'm in relationship with, no matter how imperfect they are or how imperfect I am. And I can celebrate my job. I can celebrate what I have or don't have in the bank. I can celebrate my gifts and my talents, my community, and I am at peace. Isn't that amazing? That's why God can use the Word of God to comfort us and to minister to us so that we can refresh ourselves and celebrate our lives knowing that God has forgiven us and given us grace and that his hand is upon us. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He'll lead us and guide us and direct us in our life. And uh, we can rest in his ability to take care of us and provide for us and for us to know that we are right in the center of his perfect will for each of our lives gives us a great amount of a source of peace and strength and comfort and stillness in our soul so that we can enjoy our lives. Psalm 23 verses 3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I know in my own life that when I'm tired or exhausted uh, like a sheep, I need to rest. And God is the only one that can refresh me and renew me. And, and I'm just so thankful that the God's presence lives inside of me. And when I'm tired or I have questions or concerns that I can talk to him, I can communicate to him, I can pray and ask him for help. I can confess my sins, my problems, my issues, my concerns. He always hears me. And when I'm quiet and I listen to the still small voice of God speaking to me in my heart, that word that he gives me, like a rhema word, will refresh me and renew me and give me a new vision and a new purpose and a new strength and energy for my life. Isn't that awesome? And he will do the same for you. you know, all you have to do is be honest with him and call on him and, and seek him out. He'll restore your soul. No person can restore your soul, but God can through the his Holy Spirit and through the word of God and through his presence. He says that he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Isn't that awesome? Because he's not leading me in paths of righteousness for my name's sake. I'm not trying. He's not leading me to make good decisions and right decisions and honorable decisions so that I can have a big name. He's uh, And I can be impress everybody by how righteous and good I am. No, he's saying to us, you and I belong to him. We are his children, his creation, and when we've called on his name, of course, we become his children, and he becomes our father. And he says, uh, I am leading you in the paths of righteousness for my name's sake, because I'm your father. You are my children, and you represent me in the world. And I want you to have a good testimony. And so I, want, I will guide you and direct you as you walk through this life and you listen to me. And when you come to crossroads and one road can re lead down to a path of destruction, another road can lead to blessing and honor and goodness and my protection, I will lead you. I will show you which way to go. And uh, you will not have to worry about where you go because I will direct you and order your steps because... You are my child, and I am your father in heaven. Isn't that awesome? 
I remember uh, there have been times in my life I've been tempted and and uh, to with temptation, and uh, whether it's a piece of chocolate cake or other nefarious things, and and I remember many times I would hear the Holy Spirit inside of me say, "Steve, remember whose you are. Remember who you are in me." And often that would remind me that it isn't just me that I'm living for, that I'm living for God. I'm living to proclaim the gospel message to other people. And so the choices that I make are important choices. They're important choices that could hold the destiny of, of uh, people that I meet that need to hear about the love and grace of Jesus. And, uh, and that if I make the wrong choice, that I can mess that up pretty bad. And so you, if you've called on his name, he, you belong to him and he belongs to you. He's your Abba Father and you are his child. Matthew 6.33 says that uh, we should seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to us as well. That uh, we, if put for him first, if when we put Jesus first, that God will uh, you know, give us all the things that we need if we are living for him and trying to walk uh, in the ways that he calls us to walk in and to listen to his still small voice direct us and guide us. In verse 4 in Psalm 23, it says, uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, um, nobody wants to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And yet, sometimes a shepherd leads us through valleys. And valleys can be a very dangerous and scary place for sheep because all around them are mountains and hills and, and it can be a very dangerous place to be and a very vulnerable place. And yet, in here it says that, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even though I may go through valleys and I may be afraid and I, there may be death and danger all around me, I don't have to fear any evil, for God is with me. My shepherd goes with me. So when you and I go through difficult times or we're facing death or calamities, and certainly living today these last few months uh, all around the world, we're looking at the shadow of death. And people are very afraid to die or to get sick. And we take uh, a lot of re very responsible, important precautions to, to not uh, infect other people or to get infected ourselves and to preserve our life. And that's all wonderful. But we, even in the midst of being good stewards over our health, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear the evil of this pandemic because God is with us. It says that his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Um, you know, uh, what is a shepherd's rod and staff? Well, the shepherd's rod and staff, sometimes uh, people would say, oh, well, the shepherd's rod, just spare the rod, spoil the child, and, and uh, they use it to justify uh, spanking and, uh, with a rod. And, and that's a total uh, misuse and misinterpretation of what, that what a shepherd's rod is for. I ran a foster care agency for uh, over 21 years, and I can assure you that that's not what that means. Uh, the shepherd's rod was never used to beat the sheep. The shepherd's rod was a tool that the shepherd used to guide and to direct the sheep where he wanted them to go because the shepherd cared for the sheep. And the sheep were, were harmless in that sense, that they, they didn't need to be beaten. And so they would, the shepherd would touch them on the right or left of their uh, shoulders or on their bodies if they were getting going in some place that they shouldn't go. And he would just tap them with that to remind them to, to move because they couldn't see very well. They couldn't see where they were going. And so uh, they needed the shepherd to guide them and to direct them. And they would often go where, of course, where they heard the shepherd's voice directing them. And so the shepherd's rod and staff were never used to beat the sheep. In fact, on the shepherd's staff, there was a crook on the end of that staff. And that crook was used to, uh, to retrieve sheep. Sometimes they would walk off uh, the mountain because many of the places where the sheep would graze were on mountainsides and on the sides of hills. And often they would fall over a rock and they might drop down to another level below them. And, and it would be dangerous to climb down and get them. And so the shepherd would use the crook of that staff to reach down and hook underneath them and pull them up to safety. Uh, that's hardly uh, 
the used in any way to cause any harm or fear uh, in the sheep. It was always used to care for the sheep. And the staff part was that the shepherd would often lean on that to uh, when he didn't have a stool to sit down and to stand up and to look out after the sheep and used it for support for himself. Uh, so God's rod and staff, when we're going through scary times, will guide us and direct us. And sometimes when we're going through the valley of the shadow of death, it's, uh, it's not a picnic. The shadow of death is a place where evil lurks for a lot of people. So when we go through those places, we can count on in the darkness of those journeys, we can listen and hear the still small voice of God direct us or through the circumstances of our situation, feel the nudging and prodding of the shepherd's staff to direct us to uh, a different direction than where we're going because we are, can be so easily lost and in danger. But God promises to not leave us or to desert us. Isn't that awesome? You know, John uh, in chapter 10 verses 27 through 28 said this. It said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. You know, the sheep knew the shepherd's voice because the shepherd uh, was always caring for the sheep. You know, he was feeding the sheep and comforting them when they were hurt or wounded or, you know, cleaning their their uh, uh, coats and pulling things out, burdocks and whatever else they might get in there. And and uh, the, sh the shepherd was always there caring for them. And so they would learn to hear the shepherd's voice. And when they heard the shepherd's voice, they would follow the shepherd. You know, and Jesus is saying, though others come that are robbers and thieves, they will not follow him because they don't recognize the voice of the others, those that have come to do evil. And you and I, we can learn and come to learn to recognize the shepherd's voice in our lives, and we don't have to fear. And we can listen and follow uh, God's voice when he uh, directs us and speaks to us and guides us. The other interesting thing, when we go back to uh, the rod and the staff and the whole idea of the shepherd is is uh, in Israel in places where people shepherd sheep. Uh, one day there was a, a missionary over there visiting in, in Israel and uh, he came upon this scene where there was a man and he was behind the sheep and he was throwing stones at him and, and yelling at him and screaming at him and he had sent his dogs to, to get them and try to herd them and everything was from the back and and uh, somebody said, well, what kind, of, what kind of shepherd is that? That man is shepherd and somebody said, no, that man is not a shepherd. That man is the butcher and the butcher was driving the sheep of course, to slaughter. and uh, But the shepherd goes ahead of us. The shepherd leads and guides his sheep, and they follow his voice. And I thought that was a wonderful picture of the difference between a butcher and a shepherd, and that the sheep follow willingly the shepherd, where the shepherd will lead them and guide them, because she the sheep know from experience the faithfulness and loving hand of the shepherd on their lives. Isn't that awesome? And you and I can know the same thing, that God loves us and cares for us and he'll direct us and order our steps and he has plans to bless us and to prosper us and to take care of us. Psalm 23 verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know, how many of you want to sit down at a table and eat with your enemies? <laughs> No, I didn't think so. Not many of us do. Many of us had, not knowing sometimes that maybe we had enemies. But uh, irregardless, God says, I'm going to prepare a table for you, a feasting table of celebration. And uh, I'm going to feed you and bless you at this table in the presence of your enemy so they can see that my favor and blessing is upon you in spite of whatever they feel that my hand is upon you and that I love you and care for you and I celebrate your life and I want to bless you. And hopefully, perhaps at that image and that feasting and celebration of our lives that God gives to us will encourage others to come to him, to come to the Good Shepherd, that they might enjoy the same blessings and favor that God gives upon us, his children. Uh, he anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Well, 
what is the significance of oil? Well, oil, of course, in the, in the scriptures, often represents the Holy Spirit. You anoint my head with oil. From a shepherd's perspective, it had a practical use. Sometimes when sheep grazed, uh, their head would get cut by the sharp edge of a stone buried in the grass. And the she shepherd would apply oil to the wounds to prevent infection so that they would heal properly. In the summertime, when they're out in the uh, grazing in the fields, the bugs would get into the shepherd's nose and lay eggs. This is pretty disgusting. And the larvae would drive the sheep insane. So the shepherd would cover the sheep with an oily repellent that keeps the insects away. Sometimes the sheep had to walk steep paths under the hot sun on those hillsides, and at the end of the day would be very tired. After he gave them some water, the shepherd would apply oil to soothe the tired sheep. The Lord's oil, the Holy Spirit, soothes and heals and brings joy. The Lord wants to pour over us the oil of gladness, the oil of refreshment, and uh, spiritual luxury. O oil... Uh, was expensive. And so it wasn't just something, usually olive oil wasn't just something everybody just had. It was very valued very highly. And so that shows you how much uh, God values you. Uh, in one of the commentaries, it says that perfumed oil was poured on the heads of distinguished guests when at the feasts of great personages. In other words, uh, somebody important came to town, they would have a feast that Perfumed oil was often poured on the heads of those distinguished guests. The woman in the gospel, of course, who poured the box of ointment of spikenard on the head of our Lord, acted according to the custom of her own country, which the host who invited Jesus had neglected to do. It was a way to honor someone and to bless them and show them that God's favor rested upon them. In verse 23, verse 6, it says, Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love that passage of scripture, and and as I've been preaching over the years, you discover different insights and things. And and uh, this one verse hit me one day that goodness and mercy uh, will follow me all the days of my life. I I would prefer uh, <laughs> that goodness and mercy would go ahead of me that I would always be walking into goodness and mercy. I would always be walking into wonderful, calm uh, situations of blessing and peace and love and goodness and mercy. But oftentimes that's not what happens in life. We walk into very difficult situations. We walk into conflict. We walk into division. We walk into uh, unrest and anxiety and fear and concerns and, and evil sometimes. And we walk into evil situations. And yet, this message is so powerful for you and I to not be afraid of those things. Surely, we, you know, the, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but we will fear no evil for he is with us. And he's not just with us, but if you've asked him into your life, the Holy Spirit has come and lives inside of you. And so when we walk into situation, God, who lives inside of us, the presence of God through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, walks with us into every situation we come into. You walk into a hospital room and someone is sick, you're walking in with the presence of God. You're walking in with the authority of the name of Jesus and the power and love and grace of God operational in your life. Every situation you walk into, if you uh, have asked and given your life to Christ, God puts the Spirit of God in you. If you walk into your, school, your child's school and you're having challenges with a teacher, you bring the presence of God into that situation. Uh, to your neighbor's houses, if you bring over food, you're bringing that with you, the presence of God. And, and what God is saying to us is, surely... <laughs> Every time it will happen that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That hopefully you and I, as we walk forward into our life and we walk into difficult circumstances, that, that we will change the presence of God, his love, his grace, his mercy, our knowledge of him, our ability to pray in the name of Jesus will step into those very difficult situations. And as we keep going forward with our life, that the result will be behind us will be goodness and mercy. Isn't that awesome? Think of a 
I, I can't always, I always think of a boat, a motorboat on a, on a lake somewhere. And as that boat's, you know, going around the lake and, and, uh, and behind the boat is called the wake. And, and I always think, uh, that's what I want. I want goodness and mercy to follow my wake. And if I was a boat and I was driving around, I'd drive into waves or storms or whatever, but I want goodness and mercy to go behind me. I want to be an agent of healing and help and peace and grace in my life and, and love and hope. And uh, when we walk into situations like that, surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. And it says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, I'm going to tell you, you know, if, if you believe in the promises of God, Jesus said he goes ahead of us. He said to his disciples, they said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be there also. If it wasn't so, I would tell you. Uh, and surely if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, won't I come back and take you to be with me? And this revelation of paradise and heaven and, and this process of what happens when we die is something that should give us great peace. Jesus said, you know, if it wasn't so, I would tell you. If there's no heaven, I would tell you. If there was no paradise, I would tell you. I wouldn't just lead you on. And so with you and I, when you have an eye towards heaven, when you know where you're going and you know that one of these days, if when our bodies die, and they will, whether it's the coronavirus or some other tragedy that happens, uh, these bodies are going to wear out and rust out and, and give out. And But we will continue on. Our soul will continue on to be in the presence of God. The Apostle Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Isn't that awesome? And so we don't have to be afraid and that our promise, our goal and is to that someday we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The scripture says uh, that, that I has not seen nor mind imagined the beauties that lie in store for those who love the Lord. And when we are living our life with an eye towards heaven and an eye towards eternity, looking forward to that, hopeful for that, we can live a life of meaning and power, knowing that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life, that God will never leave us or forsake us. Right, and that someday we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 16 also ends with a wonderful passage uh, that gives the same promise to us today. It says, You have made known to me the path of life. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. God will make known to you and to me and to all who call on him the path of life. He will direct our steps and order our steps and have his hand upon us because he's a good shepherd and, and we as a sheep will learn to hear his voice and follow him and direct him and he will make known to us the path of life. He will make it clear so in a way that we can understand what it is. It won't be cryptic. It won't be a complicated uh, a formula or equation we've got to solve. God will make it very clear to you and to me the path of life of where I'm going to walk and what I need to do and the choices I need to make to walk in this abundant life that Christ came to give to us. Isn't that awesome? And uh, he will fill you and I with joy. We will have joy in his presence. When we worship him, we'll find joy. When we think of him, we'll find joy. When we read his word, we'll find joy. When we're celebrating our life and our family and the people around us, we'll have joy in the presence of God. And uh, we have eternal pleasures at his right hand to look forward to. Man, that's awesome. Isn't that an incredible thing? I'd just like to pray for you today that uh, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never opened your heart to him and you've never called out to him, that uh, the word says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved, will be filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. And I, I don't know how God does that. I'm just glad he does it. And uh, I've discovered that many, many years ago in my life. And I've seen God's presence change at many, many hundreds and hundreds of people. And uh, many of you I may never meet. I mean, you're maybe listening to this on Facebook or in some other uh, media uh, platform. But, you know, you're going to call out to God. You can say this prayer with me and, and God will come and change your life. He'll forgive you. You'll receive the forgiveness for all of your sins. And you'll see, receive his love and grace and mercy and become his child, not just his creation. You're already his creation. But you become his child because you call out to him and make him your Abba Father your daddy, daddy, you'll make him your heavenly father, and he will uh, knit you in your heart into the family of God. Isn't that awesome? 
and some day you will be in his presence in eternity with eternal pleasures at his right hand. So just uh, pray with me this prayer. It's very simple. Just repeat these words after me. Obviously not for my sake, but to God. Father God, I give you my life today. I know that Jesus is the Good Shepherd. And so I call on him today. I call on Jesus for his grace. I ask and receive forgiveness for all my sins. I give you today and I commit tomorrow and uh, the rest of my life into your hands. I ask that you help me to hear your voice, that I would hear your voice louder than I've ever heard it before, and that I would be able to lay down the things, the worries, the anxieties, and the fears that I've carried, and that I would be able to walk in your peace, in your comfort, in your hope, and in your mercy. I thank you for this today. I give you my heart. And I give you my life, and uh, now and forevermore, as to the best of my ability, I'll live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you today. Thank you for saying that prayer. Uh, God heard it, and he answers. And uh, when we come to him and we open our heart, God puts the person of the Holy Spirit inside of us, and we're changed, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He loves you and cares for you. And uh, I want you to go today in his peace and his grace and his mercy, knowing that he is the good shepherd, and uh, he will guide you and direct you now and uh, tomorrow and into eternity. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day today. sent him from your side to walk among this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God.